These two just got back from Antarctica, okay? They put their initials in the ice, and so it should be drifting up soon, right? That's so crazy. The Lord was there. You know, there's nowhere you can go where the Lord isn't. And that's a good thing to remember when you're struggling with something. He's there with you. He's going to figure it out. I think if we realized how much he likes us, that it would, it would change things, okay? And I want to convince you of that. And tonight we're going to, you know, this season I decided we're going to just look at different people in Jesus' life during this passion season, 40 days of Lent that in all circles around, you know, what happened to Jesus. I want to look at different folks in his, that, that cross his path. And I want to take a peek at this one particular gentleman, Nicodemus. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the, the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? This is the word of the Lord for tonight. Now, Nicodemus is an interesting character because he keeps resurfacing throughout the gospel story. Okay? He asks, can a man be born again? And we assume that he asks that sarcastically, but the truth of the matter is it's presumptuous to assume that Nicodemus had an attitude. You see, he realized that Jesus comes from God because he says no one can do the things you do unless God is with them. And so he checks Jesus out. Today I had one of our elders come into my office and he's teaching, he's teaching kids and in uh, Sunday school, Sunday mornings. And he, the, all these kids have questions about the Bible. Well, how do we know who wrote it? How do we know it's accurate? How do we know it didn't change over the years? And all these, these questions. And, you know, so I got all kinds of books to, to pull down. <clears throat> and, and so what I did is I, I pulled them to the computer and I, and I typed in one of the questions. Boom. It's about 20 answers right there. Most of them solid Christian answers. Pulled up another question. Boom. Another set of answers. Do you see how easy it is to do your homework when you have a question? And what do people do? They don't do their homework. They cross their arms. They get an attitude. They reject the Bible. They reject the Lord. They reject the love of God. They're unwilling to believe anything and I mean, I, it took me about seven to nine seconds to type it in, and boom. Actually, it was longer than that because I'm not very good at typing. <laughs> but Nicodemus is one of the guys that checks it out. And, and now we make a big deal about the fact that he came visiting at night. You know, maybe uh, it was in secrecy because he, just, he didn't want his colleagues to know that it was him coming to see Jesus. That's what we assume, you know. But then again, I'm a night owl, okay? And maybe he's a night owl. Maybe he's got work all day and he wants to take care of a private issue. 
we got this guy who's doing miracles. Could this be the Messiah? And, and again, he checks it out. And, and I don't know if it's a personal matter, you know, does he stop by to see Jesus in secret? It might not be because he says this, we know. Okay, now who is he? He's a ruler of the Pharisees. This guy is at the top of the group. Isn't it interesting when Jesus says to him, are you the teacher of the people? Okay, so I mean, he's the teacher. He's the man. And, and so um, he's there possibly just to speak on behalf of the Pharisees. Hey, uh, you've been talking about our God. We notice you've been doing some miracles. See, uh, one of the things that the Pharisees did is they made laws. They conducted trials. They investigated heresy. Okay? So we assume that he's secretly coming at night. It's possibly the best time to have a personal conversation with Jesus about who are you? Are you the Messiah? And, and it's kind of funny because Jesus has this way of always turning things around on you. Remember, he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they come up with ideas. Oh, you're Elijah. Oh, you're one of the prophets. And then he turns it and says, who do you say that I am? Nicodemus comes along and he says, we know. And then Jesus says, you must be born again. Jesus has this way of, of uh, kind of questioning you. Where do you stand in relationship to me? And people will come up to you. <clears throat> uh, are you a Christian? No, I'm a Presbyterian. Okay? Ah, wrong answer. I just want you to know. You would say, yes, I am a Christian, and I go to a Presbyterian church. Okay? You know, who are you? Well, I'm a Christian. But, 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 but you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not one of those born-again Christians, you know. Those offensive ones that are radical and over the top and kind of fanatical and judgmental. You know, the, the people who take Jesus too seriously and take the Bible too literally. I'm not one of those guys. Now, you need to know that four out of every ten Christian, excuse me, Americans, classify themselves as born-again Christians. Okay? Born-agains. Those holy rollers full of the spirit or whatever they're full of, you know. I was with this one friend and, and she was a dynamic Christian. Everywhere we go, it was kind of a bummer. She'd want to convert everyone everywhere we went, okay? It's one of those kind of Christians. Just couldn't still help but talk about Jesus. Couldn't help but share Jesus. Couldn't help but just get involved on behalf of Jesus. And and so one time I'm with her, and, and somebody says, so um, <clears throat> what are you all about? And, and she says, well, I'm a Christian, but, but, but I'm not one of those born-agains. And I'm thinking to myself, if there ever was a born-again, <laughs> you are the definition of born-again. But you see, we're kind of scared of that label because, you know, the... the Religious right grabbed a hold of it, and we want to make sure that people understand that we're not that group of people that's out there judging folks. We're that group of people that's extending the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And, and that's what she was trying to communicate. The problem is, um, when we strive to keep our personal dignity before the, uh, the world, the fact of the matter is, Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And I think that's where sometimes we would bring up that, well, I'm not a born again because I don't want you to be scared of me. I don't want you to think that I take God too seriously. You know, back in the days when the, the West was being won, um, the, the circuit riders, they, were, they would go out and those are the guys that had a gun in one hand and a Bible in the other, and they'd go into the saloons and the different towns that were being created and tell everybody about Jesus. And, and as this was happening, the Holy Spirit was moving. And there was this phenomenon called the jerks, where, you know, the Spirit would come on you and people would jerk. And, of course, <clears throat> this was happening, and there were some Presbyterians there, and... 
you know, they were surely not going to be undignified by having jerking be part of their spiritual experience. And so this one person is in a spiritual meeting and the Holy Spirit moves and the jerks are happening and they're resisting and resisting and resisting. And finally the Holy Spirit moved on him so hard that jerked and snapped his neck and he died. Okay. So what I'm suggesting is if the Spirit of God starts moving on you, it's better to move with them than try to hold on to your dignity. Okay. You know, and, and since I'm already in the wrong spot, I'm going to talk about people <laughs> raising their hands. I know we got a bunch of people that raise their hands here in our Presbyterian church, and you know, that's not something that you're going to find in most Presbyterian churches. And it has been pointed out to me by many of our snowbirds and seasonal guests that, you know, you guys raise your hands. We don't do that in our Presbyterian church. And <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, if Jesus was to come in and you were sitting there praising him and your hands are in your pockets, or you're sitting on your hands, um, wouldn't you just hope to have them raised in worship and lost in praise and honoring your Lord? Okay. But we don't do that because it's not our way of worshiping. we too dignified to do that kind of thing. And, well, we don't want to be called born again for the same reason. Nicodemus, understand something. He represents the best of culture, his culture, education. He's the smartest, probably among the wealthiest. His ethics are impeccable. He is a religious leader. So here's a guy with all the accolades. If anybody's going to get into the kingdom of God, it's this guy. And what does Jesus tell him? Unless one is born of the Spirit, no entry into heaven is granted. It had to be a shock to him. And we know this is a good man. This is a good man. So here's a guy who's actually doing religion right. He's got the right heart, the right attitude, the right angle. And he doesn't have access unless he's going to get a hold of the Spirit. And in the conversation, he asked Jesus, how can these things be? He doesn't get it. I don't know if you've ever been in a spiritual conversation and you didn't get it. Okay. It happens sometimes. And we shouldn't get all upset. What does the Lord say in Isaiah 55? My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Sometimes the Lord messes with us so that we'll go and do our homework. Sometimes he'll lay something before us so that we'll kick it around in prayer and then there will be that moment of breakthrough where you'll understand what he was talking about and how it applies to you. You know, we're so quick to cross our arms and get offended and have an attitude and miss out on that, that place where there's a little bit of tension where God might be poking you and by the way, he's not poking you with an attitude. It's an invitation. Hey, I've got some more of me to give you. I've got a blessing to release in you. There's people that I want to touch, and, and you're my chosen vessel. Okay? So we should relax and enjoy this journey. And sometimes we don't get it. All right? And actually, this would be a hard concept to comprehend. Born again literally means begotten from above, and begotten is a biology department term. It doesn't come from the arena of theology. You and I were begotten by our parents. We have a specific DNA genetic code, a particular family history and trait. When my daughter has an attitude, I go, see, just like your mother. Okay? Okay? It's just part of who they are. Actually, I brought a personality test home, and I found out that my daughter was just like me. <laughs> that sweet little angel. <laughs> and here's the thing. Sometimes the, the ways of God, they don't make sense to us. Forgive somebody that hurt us. Okay, right there. That's a place where many people get stuck. They're not going to do that. We don't understand that the ways of God work in a different way. Uh, Thomas Edison, he invented the light bulb. He couldn't tell you why the electricity worked. It just did. 
The natural man, they focus on trying to approach God and earn his favor and, and access his, his presence. They don't realize that you don't earn that. It's a free gift given to you. See, when we're begotten from above, born again, it's a new way of thinking. It's a different attitude. It's a different lifestyle. The old ways of living and thinking and reacting and scheming are gone because life is now lived with God. You know, I had a bad experience, you know, this past week. I was uh, in a situation where um, I was, I'd been there for like 10 hours, okay? I was supposed to be there for two, and I'm there for 10. And I'm done, and then there's delays and more delays. And the only thing that wasn't getting delayed was my attitude. <laughs> and I didn't say anything wrong. I didn't release, you know, the, a, a bunch of negative words or anything like that. But, you know, my attitude, it wasn't pulsing with the compassion and love of Jesus Christ. And, and I felt really bad about it because I had an opportunity for somebody who was delayed and they, believe me, they weren't excited about this being delayed. And, and yet I could have released love. And you know, well, you didn't do anything wrong. No, but I didn't have, I didn't do anything right either. Okay. And, and I want us to be looking at life that way to say, okay. What more of Jesus can I bring to this situation? How much more of his love? What kind of attitude does he want me to bring to this situation? Rather than just, I'm inconvenienced because I've been sitting here too long. You now it's interesting, in verse 6, Jesus draws a distinction between the flesh and, and water. It, it's a different approach to life. One is the, the normal way of doing life, and one is when you're under the influence of God. And there's a big debate about what does Jesus mean by born of water and the spirit. You mean the water that's in the uterus, the water that fills our bodies? Is, is that the water that breaks when the baby's born? That's the water? Possibly. Could be talking about baptism. Realize that when John the Baptist is baptizing with water, this is a national phenomenon. Even the Pharisees were coming to the Jordan River to get baptized by John the Baptist. Okay? And so um, it could be the baptismal waters. But, but here's the deal. They're all going to the river to get baptized, to repent of their sins. But, but guess what happens the next day? A new set of sins prop up. And then they got to make that trip back to the river again, right? And, and this is the problem with, with trying to do behavior modification. It doesn't really create a new you. Now, you do set some fresh patterns in place, okay? But, but, but when it comes to, to pleasing God, we all fall short, and the only thing that's going to help us is this, God's activity, God stepping in, God making the move, okay? We're not able to keep the rules and please God. What pleases God is when we accept what he's done for us. Now, it's not surprising that Nicodemus has trouble comprehending Jesus' new orientation to God because for him, he's got to come out of a different worldview that, that is works-oriented, where God rewards good behavior and punishes bad behavior. That's his worldview. And you and I right now, our worldview that, that we dwell in is, is you know, <clears throat> secular humanism and, and capitalism and scientific reason. You know, you start talking to people about Jesus Christ and evolution. Hasn't that disproven the biblical account of creation? And if you don't have your evolutionary arguments down, okay, you're just going to get dismissed. Pluralism, the idea that everybody has the right to do and believe whatever they want. Well, now, if you haven't thought about this, guess what? This is the way everybody believes around us, and we need to be able to talk about this. Tolerance. You know, who are you to say Jesus is the only way? You're, you're so intolerant of all the other people. Well, friends, all the other people are struggling. And they, they're not getting it right. And we do have access to the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ. Okay? And we need to be getting that word out there, but we keep getting silenced. And, and I want to clarify, being born again, it doesn't mean subscribing to 
the right political agenda. It's not about abiding by a specific moral code. It's not adopting a new philosophy. Listen to me. It's walking with God. It's talking to God. It's consulting His will when you're facing a decision. It's acquiescing to God's way of handling a bad situation. It's inviting His presence into your mind and into your heart. This is what being born again actually looks like. All right? It's not a checklist. It's a personal relationship where he speaks, he guides, he tends to your soul. It's beautiful. You know, I had a seminary professor. He says, you know, I don't know what day I was born again, but there was a moment when I knew myself to be a child of God. And do you know that moment for yourself? I don't want you to raise your hand. I just want you to think with me for a moment. That moment when suddenly you were doing life with God. You were consulting God. You were talking to God. You were enjoying God. You were arguing with God. Where God was part of your, your, your mindset. And I remember I was in Sunday school and you know, I'd go to Sunday school because, you know, I, my mom made me go, and, and, and I, liked, I found myself liking to be there. I can remember singing in the garden as a little boy in the 60s in the radical sanctuary. Remember those old-time sanctuaries? Yeah. I can be way back there. I remember being in a teepee at camp, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm 11 years old or something like that, and crying over my sins. And I don't know what sins 11-year-olds can have, but I had them, all right? And I felt bad about them. I remember every night reading the Bible for a long time. And, and you see, this pursuit of, this, this exposure to, this engagement with God, what did it do? It created a relationship. And that relationship, as you feed it, Guess what happens? It grows. Nicodemus, he asked the question, a man cannot enter into his mother's womb a second time. This means he's tracking with Jesus. He understands the implications of what the Lord's saying. Because the rules of life is once you've made your mistakes, you can't undo them. And Jesus is saying, guess what? You're right, but here's the deal. There's a whole new way of doing life. It's when the Holy Spirit arrives. See, when you're living without the Spirit, you've got to do the rules. Sin doesn't enable us to do the rules. Okay? When the Spirit comes along, Jesus lived the life we should have lived. He did all the rules for us. He died the death we should have died because we couldn't keep the rules. And then he gave us his Holy Spirit to help us keep one rule. Love one another as I have loved you. Okay? And when we get it wrong, we have a never-ending second chance to restart and enter back into that relationship and let the Holy Spirit guide our path. Okay? This is how it works. Do you notice with Jesus, there's no evolution from the flesh to the spirit. You're born one way and you need to be born the other way. You don't, by the rules, attain a new level. No. Didn't, the rules don't work. What Jesus does for you, that's all that works. You need the reactivating presence of God's Spirit. Okay? And when I talk about the Spirit, you know, I get really excited about this because we believe in God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The spirit who hovered over the surface of the deep when God then started to say, let there be light. Boom. The spirit that was breathed into Adam and Eve and they became living souls. The spirit that was in Ezekiel chapter 37 and, and moved on the dry dead bones and they became humans back to life. The spirit that, of him who raised Jesus from the dead in Romans 8. That's the spirit that we're talking about. That's the spirit that Jesus has given to us. Now, let's just do this one more time. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the God that we follow and believe in, and that Spirit is living inside of us. That's pretty heavy. Okay? You know, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 2 where it says, you have received the Spirit of God, and it says, no one knows the thoughts of God, but the Spirit of God. And you have received the Spirit of God. So the thoughts of God are available to you. And you know, when you're reading the Bible, you're just creating a library for the Holy Spirit to pull things down and apply on your journey through life. And then, when you got all that in your head, he starts coming in a new language. Nothing that contradicts the Bible, but fresh applications of how it applies to each situation in your life. That's the living God living inside of you when you've been born again. Pretty serious, yeah? It's going to change the way you treat the people around us, okay? It has the ability to raise a dead marriage. It has the ability to undo the damage that other people have done inside of you. It has the ability to give you a courage that, 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 that would take over your personality that you never had before. It, it helps you be a new you, the one you were supposed to be before sin started messing with you, okay? It changes who you are. There's an old story about this, this guy who was a drunken reprobate, and he got converted. <clears throat> and his friends, you know, he starts going to church and everything. His friends are going, hey, man, you know, come, come and drink with us. Come and drink with us. You know it's okay because Jesus turned water into wine. Come drink with us. And the guy says, well, maybe he turned water into wine, but I know in my house he turned beer into furniture. Okay? <laughs> he stopped drinking, and now he had money to buy furniture. <laughs> it changes your lifestyle. And it obviously changed Nicodemus' lifestyle because the next time we see him is in John 7, 45 to 52. Something's happened. He's not the same. Nicodemus is with the Pharisees, but he's not of the Pharisees. Spiritually, he's in a different place. And this happens to us when Jesus speaks, when his words, we encounter them. You know, one time the religious leaders sent out soldiers to arrest Jesus and they came back without Jesus and they said, where's Jesus? And they said, no one has ever spoken like this man does. Okay? Jesus has a unique tone of love and compassion, empowerment and care. You know, the Pharisees in, in, in John 7, they're talking about how to destroy Jesus and Nicodemus defends the Lord Jesus. There is a law that says a man must be first tried before accused. And he immediately was scorned by his, his, his colleagues. Are you one of them? I thought you were one of us. Search the scriptures and see that nobody comes from Galilee. See, they hadn't done their homework. I think it's fascinating that Remember in the, the birth narrative of Jesus and the wise men come and Herod asks, hey, the king of the Jews has arrived. Where does he come from? And they do their homework. And they say he comes from Bethlehem. And then what do they do? Nothing. They forgot all about it. And 30 years later, when Jesus shows up, do they remember that moment? No. And so now they have to do their homework again. And, and, and I don't know, maybe you can relate. You're at work, you're in a social setting, you're at your family gathering, and somebody starts bad-mouthing Christianity. And it usually happens at a family event. You know, it does. You know, and, you know it's, it's a bummer. It's really a bummer when it's not a family event, because, you know, you can get away with stuff at the family event. But, you know, when you're in a <clears throat> secular situation and somebody starts woofing off about the Lord, and, you know, I'll, I'll try to just continue to eat my food, and my wife will usually be the one nudging me. <laughs> you going to let him say that? 
And I think it's better I start talking than she starts talking, okay? <laughs> and so, you know, you have an opportunity right there. Are you going to talk about the faith? Are you going to correct people's negative slants? Are you going to tell them the truth? A lot of times people are saying wrong, stupid stuff that isn't accurate. And are you going to say, actually, you know what? I'm one of those Christ followers and you're not speaking correctly. Here's the truth about it. What if you handled it that way? You know, and some people are going to, well, I still want to win the argument, but here's the deal. You've let people know there's another alternative to that negative slant. You know, today the problem with Christianity isn't the lack of Christian proc uh, of behavior. It's the, the lack of Christian proclamation. Uh, politically correctness has stifled us. Okay? You know, one time we had this contentious town meeting that was going to take place, and they said, Pastor, will you go and pray over the town meeting? And, and <clears throat> would you mind not being denominational. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, that's cool. I, you know, I can hang out with the Baptists, the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Catholics. I'm okay with that. They didn't mean denominational. Okay? Uh, they meant, would you not, you know, there's going to be Jews and Hindus and Buddhists and Christians. Okay? And so, of course, I do my prayer and I end it in Jesus' name. And then all those people start rushing me. You said Jesus' name. <laughs> and so I end, I'm a Christian minister, and what do you expect a Christian minister to say when he's invited to an event like this? And actually, you guys need Jesus right now. <laughs> I was so mad, I thought he was going to hit me. You know? But are you willing to go ahead and drop Jesus' name? Because this world needs Jesus. And speaking of talking about Jesus, you know, I remember one time this Christian was trying to convert a Hindu, and he wasn't getting anywhere, and he says, he says to the Hindu, look at man, you got to be born again. And the, the Hindu says, I have, I've been born again, and again, and again. <laughs> Reincarnation, okay, yes, come on. Yes. It's funny. <laughs> so Nicodemus is in the process of being a born again, and God is changing him from within. He has new priorities, new convictions. You know, again, Jesus isn't somebody that comes along with a little pick-me-up, over-the-counter, you know, in encouragement. He's not turning you on to new ways of living your old life. When you become a Christian and you're born again, God now calls the shots. You depend on Him for guidance. You engage His presence. You make your choices based on His words. And that becomes a threat to the life that you've been accustomed to. If your Christianity just too easily gels with the you, the same old you, well, then I don't know that you really understand what God has been wanting to do, wanting to root out from you, wanting to impart to you, wanting to release upon you, okay? There's a play that Thornton Wilder has, Our Town, and the character Emily, she has this unique opportunity to return back from her death and watch a birthday. And she's watching her birthday, and she realizes she missed the point of all her relationships, life's purposes. She mismanages all her decisions. And, and, and what's really cool for you and I is, you know, we do a lot of mismanagement, but guess what? You don't have to wait till you die to figure it out. Because you got a Holy Spirit that comes alongside of you and says, hey, you know what? I got a better way of doing life than the way you're doing it right now. Okay. Your failures and setbacks, they don't have to define you. You have a new chance at life that awaits you. Um, <clears throat> someone said, I thought I was born again, but I still sin. Being born again is communing with God throughout the day, seeking to please Him. Okay? And as you live close to that relationship, you continue to be dominated by sin less and less because you become Christ-focused. Very important, Christ-focused. I thought this was cool. Thomas Merton said, we're all beginners all the time. Okay? And a Bible scholar, Dale Bruner, said, I'm not born again. I'm in about my second trimester. Okay? <laughs> and, and, and really, you know, even the big shots in Scripture, Adam, Moses, David, Jonah, Peter, Paul, they all had to make U-turns. All of us, we, we, we need that never-ending second chance to be made right with God. And by the way, there's something that you need to hear. That the moment you receive Jesus into your life, you are now a heavenly being. Okay? 
You are supernaturally infused. You're equipped with a new identity. You are a child of the living God. And by the way, he dwells inside of you, and there's a power in your prayers. There's a power in your touch. There's a power that gets released when you live intentionally with and for him. It's a new you altogether. Well, Nicodemus is born again. He has a new orientation to life, and we see it again, not only in his conversations, but in John 19, he does something. He takes Christ's body down off the cross and puts it in the tomb. Think about this. This is the ruler of the Jews. And who killed Jesus? The rulers of the Jews. Okay? And... He went and investigated Jesus. Then what did he do? He, he defended Jesus. And now what is he doing? He's taking care of Jesus. You know, he didn't stop being a Pharisee and, you know, move to China to, to, to be an evangelist. He stayed with his Pharisee buddies. Okay? Probably tried to do, release a little bit of the love of God. He sees things differently. He's got new relationships, a new purpose, a new understanding of God. Can you imagine the excitement when he hears about the resurrection? Who wrapped his body? Nicodemus. So he's thinking one of two things. I didn't do a good job. (laughs) But what he said is true. Okay? You know, Nicodemus gets a bad rap for being a behind-the-scenes Christian, but I'm pretty sure that if you and I know that Nicodemus wrapped the body of Jesus, do you think that the other Pharisees knew he wrapped the body of Jesus? There's a verse in John 12. Many of the leaders were believing in Jesus, but because of the Jews, they kept quiet. Okay? Nicodemus used to keep it quiet, but now he's living his faith out in the open. And you know what I like about Nicodemus is his faith keeps unfolding through the scriptures. Does that sound like your journey? Are you unfolding? Or is it the same old you with the same old complaining attitude, self-defeated living, same old unforgiveness, same old rationalizations, same old life? Or has Jesus found an expression in your conversation? If you feel like, you know what, I think there's more to be had. All you have to do is ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life. And the same old you is going to disappear because the new you that depends on him is suddenly going to take charge And as you walk with and for him, the miraculous, the supernatural, the personal intimacy, all kinds of amazing results are going to come your way. You're now going to be living under the influence of the living God. And I could imagine some people are going, you know, Pastor, this all sounds cool and everything, but uh, I don't want to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit because I might have the jerks. Okay? I'd rather stay in control of myself. Well, I guess it all comes down to who's jerking you around. Okay? Because the world would like to jerk you away from life with God and all the blessings that come from that. And the Lord wants to jerk you away from all the negativity that comes from sin and its domination and destruction. He'd like to jerk you towards himself where he's got an eternity waiting for you and that eternity starts now. Heavenly Father, I think of that Saint Lancelot Andrews who prayed, Lord, I thank you for my call, my recall, and many other calls besides. We ask that you would 
Release the Holy Spirit upon us that we might be born again. That we might be under your spiritual influence. That the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity, will be pulsing through us. Changing us. And changing the people around us. Tired of the same old me. I'm ready to step into the new me, born again by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Friends, I got some prayer warriors who are going to be over here. We got communion for you over here. Robert, Judy, if you'd be willing to serve communion, I'd appreciate it. And everybody else, I want you to do your homework. And make sure that you're not living without the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen.